As the medical examiner concluded the autopsy the following day, a startling piece of evidence emerged. They discovered a condom. It was still inside her body. This revelation intensified suspicions regarding the events leading up to Latrice's tragic death. When her body was discovered, her pants were pulled down to her hips, yet her underwear remained in place. The autopsy revealed no signs of sexual injury. The presence of the condom raises puzzling questions for detectives, shedding light on the possibility that Latrice might have been intimate shortly before her demise. Latrice had endured nearly 40 stab wounds, indicating that this was a deeply personal and targeted attack, as the perpetrator cut her from her left ear to the right side of her neck, severing her carotid artery, jugular vein, Adam's apple, and vocal cords. The result was near decapitation. Multiple stab wounds were inflicted on her left shoulder, underarm, abdomen, and her chest with two creating exit wounds on her back. Evidence suggested that part of the struggle occurred inside her car, where the center console was broken and blood was discovered on the steering wheel. New information tonight in the deadly shooting of a mother on a street in Brooklyn. Police have made an arrest in the case. 42-year-old Claudia Banton appeared before a judge this afternoon in Florida. U.S. Marshals Fugitive Task Force picked Banton up in Jacksonville yesterday. She is charged in the execution-style murder of Delia Johnson that was caught on camera. Police say the video shows the suspect casually walking toward Johnson and shooting her in the head. Investigators say the two women were once friends, but the motive here remains unclear. As a blood-bought believer, student, servant, and disciple of the Most High Jesus Christ, you must always have an answer for why does God allow so much evil in the world. Some may say, well, God gives us free will, the Lord works in mysterious ways, or the secret things belong to the Lord. All of these answers just won't cut it when unbelievers demand an answer for why God allowed the devil to take their loved one away from them prematurely. This is where you must be skilled and studied and learned in the scriptures. In part one of this series, I listed the five major curses. There's a curse against humanity. There's a curse against the nation or the land. There are curses against you as the individual. The wages of sin is death. There's Curses against family bloodlines within your immediate family bloodline, according to Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 9, the sins of the father passed down to the third and fourth generation. And then there's also a curse against every race of people. Every race has a peculiar curse against them. All right. Now, in Exhibit A, Latrice Curtis this woman cheated on her husband with a college basketball player, and she even desired to enhance her relationship status with this man. She had no idea that this homosexual bishop was infatuated with the same man, and this bishop ended up stabbing her to death, stabbing her over 40 times, ending her life. Now, I am in no way insensitive to this tragic death, but I beg to question you. How is it that this heathen, this abomination, is still alive in prison? This beautiful young woman is dead, and now she's passed on to the afterlife. She'll never come back again. See, many people depart from the faith because these pastors are so concerned with filling their pockets, and they don't answer these tough questions. I do want to remind you of Ecclesiasticus chapter 25, verse 19, I referenced this scripture in part four, that all wickedness is but little to the wickedness of a woman. Let the portion of the sinner fall upon her. So it is our job to pick apart these scriptures and see exactly what they mean. In part three, I expressed how this portion of the sinner that fell upon the woman was evident in Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 28 and 29, where it specifies that a man was permitted to seize a virgin and grate her, okay, or what is described as humble her. The new covenant does not perpetuate those exact laws, but it leaves in its shadow manifestation of the five major curses that I mentioned earlier. Now, we commit adultery every day, but they don't get stabbed to death 40 times or their head blown off in public right afterwards. So who knows what took place in the spirit realm that led to the tragic death of these two women. I can assure you 
has something to do with the five major curses. God blessed this woman, Latrice Curtis. He blessed her with a righteous husband, and she likely would have divorced this husband to go to this college basketball star as she had lived. Latrice was a product of this matriarchal kingdom, which teaches that women are smarter than men, they mature faster than men, and they think less about sex than men. None of these things are true. Sex is far more a part of the woman's identity than it is a part of the man's identity. Why does this matter? Because the scriptures only warn men about the seduction and wickedness of the woman and not the other way around. Why? For the sake of salvation. The whole purpose of marriage, marriage and its foundation, is that servants and disciples of Christ, that they only marry within the body of Christ, the like-minded believers in Christ. Let me say that again. The whole purpose of marriage and its foundation is that those who are blood-bought believers and disciples of Jesus Christ only marry to like-minded followers of the Messiah. Okay, this is the greatest component of the package deal in the sanction of polygyny, or the exact reason why polygyny has been dismissed in the New Covenant. Let me emphasize that most people are believers under the law of Moses. And by the way, when I keep saying the law of Moses, I'm also including the law that was before Moses was even born. Okay, because you must remember that before Moses was even born, men were allowed to marry their sisters. Okay, they were allowed to marry within their immediate bloodline. But once the law of Moses came, that was a privilege that the law of Moses took away from men. Because again, sin progressively got worse. Let me explain a little deeper what I mean by that. You see, the less a field of believers, the less God wants women to marry. Because God, the perfect will of God, again, is that men are only marrying women who are believers and vice versa. Okay, but I keep emphasizing women because there are far more women than men. Okay, and if there are no women, if there are no men getting married or all the men marry up the women, okay, there are going to be women who are not married. You see what I'm saying? I also want to add that God shortened the physical prime of a woman. He has far less years of beauty and fertility than the days of Sarah. Sarah, who was a woman who retained her beauty well into her 90s. It is my opinion that one of the reasons why Christ is coming back is that the bloodlines will become so tainted that he has to gather his bride because even the sanctification of marriage will no longer be holy because sin keeps taking things from us. Again, it progressively gets worse, even to the end of days. Which leads to the theme of part five here. Are we picking on polygyny? Or are there hundreds of things sin has taken from us since creation, but most of the people are too spellbound by the matrix to carefully discern the patterns in the scriptures? This is the point in the series where I will really rattle and stir up the demons who put the wool over the eyes of many and keep them bound by the matrix. So I listed several things that sin is taken from us. Let's start with Adam. Adam lost his immortality and the time clock on life started. You look at the word since, that's I-N-C-E. This word is in reference to time. It's a concept from time or a derivative of time. Sin, S-I-N, is rooted in the word since. S-I-N-C-E. You see that? Another question they need to ask God is, if skin color don't matter, and God just decided to make people all shades and colors, which is a dumb excuse that people give for, you know, all the different rainbow colors, or Jesus loves the little children when they sing red, yellow, black, or white. This is an ignorant response, okay? If that's the case, why does the wrath of the sun strike Esau the harshest? 
Okay, and it turns his skin red. Now, isn't that an evil thing? Why would God allow that? Okay, let me give you a hint. Rooted in the word skin, S-K-I-N, is sin, S-I-N. See that? That is how the Gentiles inherited the recessive gene, okay? They were plagued more by the sin of the fallen angels, which I talked about in part two. Some of the other things is the, the animals, they turned on men, okay? Remember, Adam named the animals. So Adam was able to communicate with the animals. At one point, there was not enmity between Adam and the animals. He commanded them. Okay, but again, sin progressively gets worse. Okay, in the book of First or Second Kings, one of the false prophets gets mauled by an animal, by a lion. The prophet Elisha commanded a bear to maul the children who were mocking him. Okay, so these are some of the curses that came on men. Obviously, men also used to live 10 times longer. Okay, men used to live into 900 plus years. Another thing that sin is taken away from us is we Israelites, we lost Jerusalem. Okay, Jerusalem was where we practiced in, in our privacy and the land space or the landscape. But the land was provided to us to practice polygyny. Okay, without Jerusalem, without having that privacy, now you're at mercy of the heathen. And again, as I explained earlier in this series, the heathen went into our women and defiled them. Okay, so that compromised our ability to practice polygyny. Then you look at words like sincere, insinuate, or the word sing, S-I-N-G. Okay, they all have the word sin, S-I-N, okay? Remember Eve. As I explained earlier in this series, she inherited a faith deficit. And again, Ecclesiasticus 2519 says, let the portion of the sinner come upon her. So what exactly does that mean? Let me read a list of words here. Okay, and I'm going to, again, I'm unraveling your mind from the matrix. Okay, and see how deep the rabbit hole of sin really goes. And how they always put the truth in plain sight. People never pay attention to these things. The word believe, deceive, conceive. These words have Eve's name rooted in them. Achieve, breathe, leave, naive, perceive, receive. All of these words have negative connotations. You may say, well, how does the word believe, how is that a negative connotation? Because men who was with God, if he had never sinned, he would not have to believe. Okay, as I explained earlier in this series, when Adam fell, he went blind. He was unable to see God. That's why God said, Adam, where are you? Okay, now for man having to believe, having to fast and pray, all right, that's a curse against man. Okay, and these these words are also depicting how the portion of the sinner falls upon Eve. That's why her name is rooted in these words. And I know this is next level type teaching. People never pay attention to this. You see, that's why they talk about Christmas Eve. Okay, the synagogues, they, they know the power of words. You think they created Christmas just for Christ's birthday. No, it's not to celebrate Christ. They're sending subliminal messages. Okay, you look at this word evil. That has Eve's name written in it. You have to remember that Adam only named Eve after they sinned. Before that, she was just known as the woman. But looking at the word devil, okay, the two become one flesh. You see that? Eve and the serpent, the devil. Okay, so now Eve's name, evil and devil. 
Okay, but I don't have time to get too deep into that. I just wanted to provide surface level understanding here and get your wheels turning. But what does all of this have to do with polygyny? Again, because I want to stay on track. Polygyny is a package deal. I wanted to go deeper into understanding just to give you an idea of how deep the rabbit hole of sin goes and how incredibly expensive sin really is. Okay. But looking at how it directly affects polygyny, as I've talked about earlier in this series, a man can no longer put another man to death and the woman, his wife, who's committed adultery against him, who can no longer put both of them to death, like under the Old Testament law. As I stated earlier, a man also can no longer marry within his family bloodlines. As I mentioned earlier in this series, it once was a privilege for a man to marry his sister. He didn't have to travel to another man's household, pay that man a dowry for his daughter, and risk marrying into another family's bloodline that may have been tainted with fallen angel blood. You see that. So this was a privilege that the law of Moses took away. Another thing is most women are not virgins prior to marriage. In the Old Testament, it was the opposite. Most women were virgins prior to marriage. So they were fulfilling the standards of holiness. Also, today, the matriarchal kingdom has replaced the system of the patriarchs the kings and the patriarchs, okay? And as I stated earlier, the Edomites defiled our wives during the transatlantic slave trade and during the captivity of Jerusalem. So all of these things have dismissed the practice of polygyny. Looking at the eviction notices, with an eviction notice, when an eviction notice is sent, person is given 30 days to remove themselves from the premises. So now I will address the argument in support of polygyny that the patriarchs, the Israelite kings and rulers like King David, King Solomon, Abraham, etc. They say that these men had multiple wives, but they forget that King David and Solomon, they were on eviction notice, but not yet evicted from the land literally evicted from the land because eventually the Israelites would be evicted from the land as I will explain later. And once they were evicted from the land, that incapacitated them from practicing polygyny and from fellowshipping with the Most High God. You see, God knew these evictions would enslave the Israelites to the heathen and subject their women to be defiled through great and the men would have no land to house all of their wives. So again, the land of Israel itself is a package deal with the practice of polygyny. So let's read through these eviction notices in the scriptures, because I promise to provide you scripture. First, right, so let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 17. It says, neither talking about a king, Neither shall he multiply wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he greatly multiply silver and gold for himself. Okay, so God has given the Israelites an eviction notice. Okay, they haven't been evicted yet, but this notice is to them. If a king multiplies wives for himself, then that's going to institute generational curses down to his sons, like it did to King Solomon's son, Rehoboam, who lost nine-tenths of the kingdom to Jeroboam. Jeroboam was a servant of King Solomon. King Solomon tried to kill him, and he failed, because the prophecy already went out that because King Solomon disobeyed the Most High, nine-tenths of the kingdom would be given to his servant. And then the generational curses, although it would take hundreds of years, all of these sequence of events led to the eviction of Israel altogether. Okay, but in Deuteronomy 17, 17, 
God is just giving them notice. You understand that? Go to Deuteronomy chapter 28, starting at verse 30. Now, notice the word shall is being repeated here, meaning God is giving them notice. Just like in a eviction notice here in the world, so long as the person pays the rent, then the notice goes away. Okay, because they've already fulfilled their obligation. Okay, so God is saying shall because Israel will have the opportunity to repent, but we know that they didn't. Okay, so these things literally manifested and eventually fulfilled the eviction notice to an eviction. All right, so starting at verse 30, it says, You shall betroth a wife, you shall be engaged to a wife, but another man. Shall lie with her. You shall build a house, but you shall not dwell in it. You shall plant a vineyard, but you shall not gather its grapes. Okay? So if a man betroths a wife and a another man lays with her, she's been defiled. Now, that right there is already compromising their ability to practice polygyny. Because as I've stated repeatedly on this channel, they already had to make consecrations just for the impurity of the woman, multiple women whom they were married to, multiple concubines, all right? So you can see the deficit of sin that this whole dilemma creates when another man goes into her, defiling her altogether. Now, many of the women who once were virgins Okay, talking about their foremothers, now these women are harlots, and I'll get to that a little bit later. But let's continue down to verse 33. It says, A nation whom you have not known shall eat the fruit of your land and the produce of your labor. See, that's further compromising the man because he had to provide the, the fruit of his labor had to go to his wives and his children. Okay, even to this day, Again, talking about the curse against the so-called black man, we can see how that impacts our people, okay? Because a lot of these curses in Deuteronomy 28, most of them have come to pass, okay? Continuing, it says, and you shall be only oppressed and crushed continually. So that, in effect, that affects the entire household, okay? A man can't have multiple wives, God will not put more on you than he can build. But nevertheless, let's continue down to verse 41. I'm not going to read through all of these scriptures for time's sake. You can read it during your own time. But verse 41, it says, You shall beget sons and daughters, but they shall not be yours, for they shall go into captivity. Okay, the whole point of marriage, in particular, being fruitful and multiplying, now, if you don't read the entire Bible and these select scriptures to get further context on what God is actually saying, they just go to the scripture that says, be fruitful and multiply, but they don't read through these scriptures here, understanding that there was a lease agreement, okay, the land, the earth has a lease agreement, and the children of Israel used to be over the earth, but they violated the terms and conditions of that lease agreement. So now this is eviction notice again, okay? So once the sons and daughters go into captivity, that's compromising the family. Because now the sons and daughters are both subject to be slaves. And that included sex and ritual abuse, all right? This is why celebrities, many black celebrities today are so wicked. Verse 48 says, Therefore, you shall serve your enemies whom the Lord will send against you in hunger and thirst and nakedness and in need of everything. And he will put a yoke of iron on your neck until he has destroyed you. Verse 51, and they shall eat the increase of your livestock and the produce of your land until you are destroyed. They shall not leave you grain or nor wine or oil, or the increase of your cattle, or the offspring of your flocks, 
until they have destroyed you. Okay, so this again is compromising our families. Verse 64. Now, this is real pivotal to the land space that I was talking about. Okay, the purpose of the Most High and keeping the children of Israel consecrated. Consecrations is what permitted primarily, that's what permitted men to have multiple wives. But here in verse 64, it's saying, Then the Lord will scatter you among all peoples. See, that's integration. That's integration. And in Leviticus 13, the children of Israel were consecrated. Even during the days of King David and King Solomon, Edomites were not in their land. Okay, there was no integration because the Gentiles were unclean people and God is a holy God. Okay, and he said to the children of Israel, you are my people and you're above all the peoples of the earth because you're a holy people. Okay, but here in verse 64, he's saying he'll scatter you among all peoples from one end of the earth to the other. There you shall serve other gods, which neither you nor your fathers have known, wood and stone. Okay, going back to verse 54, it says, the sensitive and very refined man among you will be hostile toward his brother, toward the wife, not wives, toward the wife of his bosom, and toward the rest of his children whom he leaves behind. See, this is eviction notice. God is letting them know you're not going to have, because it was a privilege for a man to have multiple wives. Outside of the consecrations and holiness, as long as man was fulfilling his duties to the Most High, God allowed him to be fruitful and multiply. But here in Deuteronomy 28, the Lord is saying that they're going to be few in number amongst the heathen, and they're going to be scattered. Catch that. They're going to be few and scattered. So that contradicts being fruitful and multiplying. Okay, God was speaking to Abraham, who was obedient to the Most High, but he said, be fruitful and multiply. He was speaking to Adam. Although Adam had disobeyed God, he wasn't in the advanced stages of sin, in a defeated state, fallen state, like men will become after Deuteronomy 28 or the fulfillment of Deuteronomy 28, many generations later. You see that. So again, we have to put these scriptures into context. We go to 1 Samuel chapter 8. This is another eviction notice. The children of Israel, many generations after Deuteronomy 28 was read to their forefathers, the children of Israel didn't learn a lesson. It says here, 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 4, it says, Then all the elders of Israel gathered together, and came to Samuel at Ramah. And they said to him, Look, you are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. Verse 6. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. So Samuel prayed to the Lord. Verse 7. And the Lord said to Samuel, heed the voice of the people and all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them, according to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, with which they have forsaken me and served other gods. So they are doing to you also. Verse 9. Now, therefore, heed their voice. However, you shall solemnly forewarn them and show them the behavior of the king who will reign over them. Now, I know in this verse is speaking singular about a king. Okay, but really, this is sort of a metaphor. But a sequence of events that's going to happen many generations after this prophecy from Samuel. Okay, so verse 10, it says, So Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who asked him for a king. And he said, 
This will be the behavior of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for his own chariots and to be his horsemen. And some will run before his chariots. They're okay, talking about the draft and military. Verse 12, he will appoint captains over his thousands and captains over his fifties. He will set some to plow his ground and reap his harvest and some to make his weapons of warfare and equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers, cooks, and bakers, and he will take the best of your fields, your vineyards, and your olive groves, and give them to his servants. He will take a tenth of your grain and your vintage and give it to his officers and servants. So really, this is just repeating Deuteronomy chapter 28. Many of the curses mentioned in Deuteronomy 28. Skip down to verse 18. It says, And you will cry out in that day because of your king, whom you have chosen for yourselves, and the Lord will not hear you in that day. Okay. Now, how do I know this wasn't referring to King Saul? Because King Saul, after his tenure as king, we don't hear these manifestations of his kingship. Okay, this isn't mentioned in the chronology of the events, even in the chronicles of the kings. It's not mentioned among the crimes that King Saul committed or the offenses against God. So it wasn't talking about one king. It's just reiterating Deuteronomy 28 when God told the children of Israel that your enemies will rule over you. Okay, it's talking about the transatlantic slave trade. Okay, and all of the generations that succeeded them. Okay, we go to Leviticus chapter 19, verse 29. This is another eviction notice. See, all of these eviction notices that God gave to the children of Israel, letting them know right now your land is plentiful. You have wives, you have horses, you have gold and silver, you got chariots. He's just letting them know, don't mess this up. Okay, or well, all of these curses are going to come upon you. So when the Most High evicted them, he knew he was taking polygyny away from them. Okay, so the one verse here, verse 29 in Leviticus chapter 19 says, Do not prostitute your daughter to cause her to be a harlot, lest the land fall into harlotry and the land become full of wickedness. You see that? God commanded them not to marry the foreign women, but they disobeyed that. Those foreign women were harlots because they weren't raised up under the laws and statutes of the Most High. Okay, the last eviction notice. Let's go to 2 Kings chapter 21, and we're going to read verse 13. Well, we'll start at verse 12. Okay, it says, Therefore, thus says the Lord God of Israel, Behold, I am bringing such calamity upon Jerusalem and Judah that whoever hears of it, both his ears will tingle and I will stretch over Jerusalem, the measuring line of Samaria and the plummet of the house of Ahab. I will wipe Jerusalem as one wipes a dish, wiping it and turning it upside down. So I will forsake, verse 14, so I will forsake the remnant of my inheritance and deliver them into the hand of their enemies, and they shall become victims of plunder to all their enemies, because they have done evil in my sight and have provoked me to anger since the day their fathers came out of Egypt, even to this day. You see that? Those are all the eviction notices, okay? All these eviction notices are tied back to Deuteronomy chapter 28. So, again, putting it into context, in Deuteronomy 17, 17, when God said, A king shall not multiply wives for himself, it was forewarning them of the harlotry that they were going to fall into, which was going to lead them into captivity because the land has become defiled. You see that? And once the land becomes defiled, the sacrifices that and the consecrations that the children of Israel was making to God shall no longer be satisfied to him. 
because those consecrations is what kept the blood holy because it was through animal sacrifice. There had to be some sacrifice of bloodshed on the altar of the Lord. And the children of Israel were not able to keep up with that. And again, the woman loses blood every month. So today, all of these evictions have manifested. They no longer fulfill holiness because there is a new covenant in Christ, which commands that we as the children of Christ in the body of Christ, that we become a living sacrifice of our bodies through self-control. And that's a whole entire new covenant. Okay, and you can't do that when you're practicing religiony, because the scriptures say, shall a man take the members of his body and make it members of a harlot, because the two become one flesh. See that? But I'll get into that in part six.